Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14 says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, and for days, and for years. And so by God's creation, we mark uh, days, we mark months, we mark years, we mark seasons, of course. Uh, you know, we, we watch the sun go across the sky. And, uh, you know, it, from day, uh, daylight to sunset uh, to mark time, we see it go from dark to, to light and back again. The moon moves across the sky. You know, we see a full moon to a new moon. And then we start over again. And by that, we can almost uh, mark the months uh, that go by. Uh, man has been good at devising time. It's amazing what uh, man has done. From the sundial, you know, to, to, to measure time. But that created a problem. Sundial was a day. And so what was the night watchman going to figure out what time it was to get for his shift to end because he couldn't do that, you know, didn't have the sundial, didn't work. I read where the Romans liked the sundial so much that they had pocket sundials. That's kind of, you know, I wonder if Apple put those out. <laughs> but, you know, look at, oh, let's see, get lined up just right and see what time it is. And so, but we went from that to the hourglass that had to constantly be turned over, and who has time for that? So somebody invented a 12-hour hourglass. 12-hour hourglass. Well, what do you suppose the problem with that was? It's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy. Tall, and it's pretty heavy, certainly. And so there's always been ways to measure time. But it didn't become more accurate until the mechanical clock with the swinging pendulum was invented. And that way it could keep time better. And then there was the quartz clock, the atomic clock, and digital clock. And we go on to these electronic timepieces that we have on our wrist and at home. And some were better, some not so good. But they all failed to answer one question. When does time end? When does time end? How much time is left? It does not, though, all these time pieces, all these methods for measuring time cannot tell us how much time is left. And the answer to this question solely rests with who? Our Creator. We've been studying a lot about that in, on Wednesday nights as we look at the end times and the rapture of the church and tribulation that is uh, forthcoming. And no, but nothing in these time pieces tells us how much time is left. But our text today tells us something for certain. That time is passing quickly. And what Paul says is that Time is almost over. And so as we read our text this morning, uh, we'll find that it, it probably isn't very much time before we stand before, uh, if you're saved, before we stand before the Lord in judgment, at the judgment seat of Christ. It's very close, I believe. And so it's time as Paul is writing, he's telling us that it's later than we actually realize that it is. It's later than we actually re realize. And Paul was writing this, you know, 1950 some odd years ago, telling uh, the folks in Rome as he had uh, gotten to Rome, as God had promised him that he would get to present the gospel in Rome to preach there, that he is telling them that, that the time is coming to an end, that the, that the time is passing quickly. And there's not as much time as we think that we have. And so he says, it's time to wake up. And certainly, as he said, that wrote it and spoke it that many years ago, we know that today that time is running out and we may not have as much time as we think we have. 
And so we must wake up. And that's exactly what Paul writes concerning the urgency uh, of the day. And so beginning in verse 11, we read, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake up out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for letting us come this way again. Lord, we thank you and praise you for you are holy. And Lord, you are worthy of our praise and our honor. You are worthy of of hands being lifted and voices shouting out praises to you. Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you for all that you have done for us. Open up our hearts this morning to receive your word. Give us understanding of the scriptures and give us, Heavenly Father, a sense of urgency. Lord, in the times that we are living, that it is time for us to live right before a lost and dying world, to live in holiness to live in your righteousness, that others might come to realize their great need. And Heavenly Father, not only that we are pleasing to thee, but Lord, that others see you in us and desire salvation as well. Lord, we ask you to help us in this day. Guide us and direct us in this hour and this message, Lord, to only uh, please you and Lord, to help us. Lord, we love you this morning. We ask you to guide us and direct us. Forgive us of our sin. For it's in thy name we pray. Amen and amen. And so Paul says that it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up and do what the Lord has called us to do. Now if we begin to look at the scripture this morning, i got three points as usual. We won't go to four. We'll give you three this morning. And that is about holiness. And the first thing that Paul does is he's in Rome. And we're going to get into, uh, before we end today, we'll get into the atmosphere of Rome. But it certainly applies to us today as it did to the Rome, to Rome uh, and the citizens there in the day of Paul. He starts out by saying in verse 11, And that, knowing the time, now, when uh, the Lord, when, when God's Word, uh, God's Word inserts sort of that phrase, and that, knowing the time, or therefore, what you usually have to do in the Scriptures is back up, because Paul here is tying some things together. Now, he says, and that knowing the time, uh, that now it is high time to wake out of our sleep. And so Paul is calling Rome, calling the citizens. He is calling us. God's Word is calling us to holiness. God's Word is calling us to His righteousness. You see, there's no righteousness in us. Our righteousness, the Bible is very plain. Our righteousness is His filthy rags. The truth is we have nothing to offer in holiness. We are uh, 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 created and we are fallen in sin. And if we got what we deserve, we'd be in hell already. And so what God has done is He saved us and He's called us to serve Him. But it's not in our righteousness because we don't have Him. It is, we are clothed in Jesus Christ. If we've been called, we are clothed in Him and we are clothed in the righteousness of God. And I, 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 it, it comes to me right now, and I, I'm going to say this, though it has no uh, bearing necessarily on the message, but, well, I guess it does. But we are clothed in Him. And so it's very comfort, knowing that I'm a sinner saved by grace, that I'm clothed in Jesus Christ. I'm clothed in the righteousness of God. My sin is cast as far as the east is from the west and cannot be brought up before me again. Yeah. And so when, when God looks upon Jamie Harvey, do you know what he sees? He sees his son. 
He sees His Son because I'm clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm in this flesh. I know that. And that is why Paul is calling us to personal holiness, to personal righteousness. He, he says, so we look back when he said, and that knowing the time. So we back up and see what Paul is talking about. And so if we read verses 9 and 10 of the same opening, he says, for this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And so even I notice as we uh, preached uh, recently about the, these Commandments, and these are commandments of God that are given to man that uh, as in our relation to mankind. Well, that is why Paul is calling us to righteousness because who do we present ourselves to? It is man that sees how we live. It is man that sees how we talk. It is man that we are witnessing to uh, that they see uh, Christ in us. And that doesn't change the fact that we should have no other God before us and no graven image or anything of that nature. But he is addressing those commandments of God that we present ourselves in righteousness before man. And so Paul here is reminding us that we are to live in the righteousness of God. I've already said we're created in Christ Jesus to be like, uh, like Him. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, uh, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by what? The renewing of your mind, uh, uh, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So daily we are to be transformed and renewed of mind to live as Christ as Christ lived, to live in the righteousness of God. Now, we notice that it says that the night is nearly over. It says, knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believe. The night is far spent. And so he tells us that the night is nearly over and the day is at hand. Well, Paul tells us as well to put on the armor of light and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because if that the night is far spent, the day is at hand, we are to be the armor of light. Why? Because we're to be what Jesus as Jesus Christ. We are to be the light in the darkness of this world. And to make no provision for the flesh. So if we are to be uh, the light in the darkness of this world, then what do we need to do? We need to wake up. We need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to be that armor of light to a lost and dying world. So Paul is calling us to righteousness. Now, it comes to mind, some of them might say, boy, the preacher just thinks we're terrible crowd. Uh, no, but I know what I am. I know who I am. I know that we are here and we are in this flesh. And let's be, I was going to say this uh, uh, much farther into the message, but we're, I'm feeling led right now. I know what I am and we are flesh. And this flesh has a great deal of power over us. And I tell you, uh, uh, certainly we need to walk in faith. We need to live in the Spirit. But while we are here, we're in this flesh. And this flesh is a battle. That's why I always say, as I realize that Satan is the arch enemy, I realize that he's a troublemaker. I, I, I really feel this way. And, and I don't know about you, but I'm going to speak for myself. And, and if I say it the way I'm thinking, it, I'm going to be in trouble come tomorrow. Because I'm going to say, I don't necessarily always feel like Satan is my biggest problem. But now he's going to be one. And uh, But my flesh is. My flesh is. 
And so, but Paul says, make no provision for the flesh. So if we're not making provision for the flesh, what he's calling us to do is make provision for God's righteousness. And so that we live that life before a lost and dying world. So we are called to personal holiness, or called to God's righteousness. And so as we move on, we find that there's an urgency to our righteousness. Look again at these two verses, and we'll read them several times. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation uh, near, now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And so there are several phrases, you can, if you want to underline them in your Bible, but it says, knowing the time, awake out of sleep, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. All these phrases point to one particular thing, and that is urgency. How many of you believe Jesus is coming? I hope everybody. You think He's coming soon? I do. Is He coming in my lifetime? I don't know. I don't know. But I hope so. I, uh, so, knowing that, Paul said, and Paul said it again, short of 1900 years ago, but maybe 50 or some odd years ago, I don't know the exact time, but in that neighborhood, since we look at Jesus Christ dying in the year, what, 30 or 36, somewhere in that. And so we're coming, oh, nearly 2,000, a long time ago. And Paul was said, it's, it's an urgent matter. He said that, and he said, we know what time it is. And it's high time. In other words, we need to get busy. It's high time. It's important. That for times of procrastination should be over. You know what procrastin procrastination is? Pro pro uh, let me tell you this too. I'm not an amateur procrastinator. I'm procrastinator. You get to say it? I'm, an, uh, I'm not an amateur procrastinator. I'm a procrastinator. And what that means is what you know you should do you put it off. What? That's procrastinating. And so Paul is saying we need to stop procrastinating. We need to realize that time is running out. He says it is later than we realize. If Paul said that that many years ago, what do you think today is? You know that today Jesus could come? And, 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 he's, and Paul's calling us to personal holiness, to uh, God's righteousness, to live that personally. And if he said it that long ago that it's later than what you think, well, if it was later than what, what they thought then, he could come. He could come today. He could come before y'all eat ice cream. And let me tell you what. If he comes before y'all eat Christ and ice cream, I'm going up there and I'm laughing at every one of you faces. <laughs> now some of you don't know why. But I might have to miss the ice cream because I have to do some preparation for some medical stuff tomorrow. And yeah, as far as I'll go. And so on Wednesday night when I said something about that, yeah, Keith, I'm going to get you. Uh, there was sympathy. There was much of awe. You know, and one man sat here and laughed. Because, <laughs> and my wife will tell you about ice cream. She's got these little, I, I'm going to get off on that. She's got these, bought these little blue, uh, no, what, what, little cups of ice cream. And oh, if we'll, if we'll eat that just a little bit, little cups, thing, it's a thimble of ice cream. And, but if you see what I fix on ice cream, it's in a cereal bowl mounded up. And so, you know, I don't do these little cups. I love ice cream, but I've got to do that. And so anyway, Bible, Paul is saying, look, we need to get busy. Uh, Jesus could come before you eat ice cream. Jesus could come. And I will have to go through those procedures tomorrow, praise the Lord. And we'll be in the presence of the Lord. But as much as we rejoice in knowing that we'll be in the presence of God, there are people that are lost and undone that live before. We need to be that light. So Paul says it's urgent that we take to 
mind what God has called us to do. That we are living in Christ. And this time that God has created, these seconds, these minutes, these hours, these days, these years, it, this time is running out. And since He is the Creator, the originator of time, we must understand that from the very creation, He knew what He was doing in, in the end of times as well. And that history is not circular like some religions believe that, you know, you live and you go into a circle, re reincarnated and go again. But that history is linear. And from the very time of creation, through death, uh, through uh, Moses and uh, Noah, Moses, David, the, the prophets, into the birth of Christ, the death of Christ, and the church, then the time is linear and God has a plan in place. And that plan is the redemption of man. That's what it's all about. His redemptive plan and the kingdom of the Lord, the kingdom of Christ. So Paul is saying that we must stop putting this off. We must stop procrastinating. He says awake out of sleep. Awake out of this slumber. And let's get busy. Now I think sometimes. Well time can put us to sleep. There are those that said, have said where is the time? I believe that's in Timothy right? Where Paul's on Timothy and those say, where is the coming? That's what people are going to be saying in this day. Y'all, you say, the, I've been hearing preachers say for all my life, Jesus is coming. And He's coming soon. Right? They've even got a song, Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. And y'all keep saying, Jesus is coming. When is He coming? You keep telling it. And, the, and people go to sleep. Christians go to sleep. Because time can put us to sleep. And we go to sleep because we really don't see, many don't see the timing of the Lord. Because that's in God's hands. But He has given us plenty in His Word to know. Not only did He proclaim that He's coming, but He has given us, has given us those things that must take place prior to His coming to get the church and then beyond that. We've been in Daniel and uh, uh, chapter 9 on, on this past Wednesday night. And we didn't get into those 70 weeks and I, I'm not looking to get into it this morning. But 69 weeks of the prophecy of Daniel have already concluded and the 70th week is coming. But we are in the days of grace. You must understand that the prophets that did not know anything about the church uh, God did not reveal that to the prophets of old. And so when Daniel proclaimed or was given understanding of the 70 weeks, 69 weeks had passed. We are in the days of grace. You want to be saved? You need to get saved now. Because the 70th, 70th week, when Jesus Christ comes, to rapture us, the church out of here. To take His bride. And we go up to be with Him. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We'll go to the judgment seat of Christ. We'll be with the Lord. But in that moment, I believe that 70th week begins. For this world. For this world. And so we have to realize, it's urgent. Paul is saying, wake up. It is time to get busy. To live in holiness for the Lord. The time is at hand. And what is that time? Christ is coming. He's saying uh, it is high time to wake high up for uh, now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Now, I got saved as an 18 year old boy. I know I've told you this a bunch of times but I got saved that day. All these years I have been being saved. I'm being saved right now. You are too. If you're saved, if you've accepted Jesus Christ and His salvation, you got saved on that day, you're living in salvation, you're still being saved, and our salvation is coming when Jesus Christ comes. We'll be getting out of here. We won't, we won't be living in this dreadful world. We won't be living with all this uh, lunacy. We won't be living with all this craziness. We'll be out of here. And He's saying the time is at hand. What time, Jesus? Jesus is coming. 
And I, I would uh, uh, venture to say that there's uh, uh, not a single person in here. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And so Paul has called us to righteousness. Paul is telling us it's urgent. We need to live as the Lord would have us uh, to live. And so uh, by God's Word, uh, we need to live because there might be somebody we know that's watching us. One of the gentlemen I worked with the other day, he, he kind of, I, I don't know, it just came out of nowhere, kind of surprised me. Uh, he was talking about, I, I just want to be good to my fellow man. I, I want to treat people right. I want to do what's right. And he got talking about, we we all people need to understand, we all going to be judged. We got a little confusion about what judgment that. And I, I was trying to help him out with the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. Because I told him, I said, listen, I'm going to be at the great white throne judgment. What I was trying to find out is what he thought and what he was feeling. And because the next morning I said, you know, you kind of jumped out uh, out of nowhere with that. It kind of surprised me. But were you under conviction? I asked him the other morning. He said, I'm under conviction every day. And I said, well, let's talk about this thing. I said, he's not my salvation. But about living and being good to mankind. And I said, well, being good, you be good to God and that will take care of the rest of it. You live according to Him. And that's what Paul is saying to do. To live in holiness. To live in God's righteousness. To have our own... He's calling us our personal holiness before God. And the only, the only way we have holiness and righteousness is because of the righteousness of God. And he's saying it's urgent. We must start living for the Lord. And this is where I was going to say, no, I don't think... That we're living with a bunch, we're in church with a bunch of heathens. The preacher does not think that the crowd here at Madison is uh, all need to get saved. Y'all need to be saved. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. But no, he does not think that we're a bunch of heathens in here. But we're a bunch of people clothed in flesh. And that flesh. Can get next to you. Last time I checked, there's not a perfect person in here. And so Paul is saying, now, after he has called us to righteousness, and after he has said it's urgent, the urgency of our personal holiness, he speaks about the nature of holiness. It's the practice of personal holiness. Now, there's a negative side to this in Paul's message. Now, remember where he is. Okay? He's in Rome. Now, in Rome in that day, that is the hotbed. Maybe not a good word to say it, but way to say it. For immorality, debauchery, excessive. See, they didn't live in monogamy. No, they had to have uh, or orgies. They didn't think that... Now, I didn't come to preach on alcohol. But I'll go ahead and say, Be not drunk with wine, where is it is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. They didn't have that just one sip. No, they had to get drunk. They didn't have to just. They didn't just have to eat that little bitty bowl of ice cream. They had to eat that big old bowl of gluttony. They were excessive in everything that they did. So that's why you have to understand this. But Paul is writing to the Romans. He's addressing how they live and with all this excessiveness and all this immorality, and so he's telling them. But you can't live like that. He's, he's drawing them to Christ. And many have been saved. There's a lot of Jews in Rome. And there are many that have been saved. But knowing that they are in the flesh, and knowing that we are in the flesh, there are things that can call us to. And we have to be careful about that. I'm not, you know, I'm not just saying I'm talking to an immoral crowd and, 
you know, excessive crowd and all that. But I said, I know me. Well, guess what? You know you. And so Paul is saying, you, he's calling us to righteousness. He's saying it's urgent uh, for righteousness. And the, one of the things with the church is today, many in the world can't tell the difference from world and church. Because too many in the church live like the world. Amen? Is that not right? And so I, I believe that our biggest problem in winning people to Christ is we're not doing what Paul said, knowing the time, it's high time, awaken and live for Jesus. Live holy lives. And that's every single one of us. And so he brings in that negative part. That uh, where he says, cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. And so he's addressing that nature. We're to cast off the works of darkness that will bring us shame at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen? Where we will give an account for how we live for the Lord. We're going we're gonna to be judged, yes. And we got some filth that the Lord has to deal with. We, we, we may leave clothed in white, but it's, we got to be addressed first by the Lord. And we will give an account for what we have done for Christ. We'll be judged. And there won't be any but, but, but. It'll be laying down and saying, God, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. That I've not lived in the fullness of of thy salvation. That's what, like David said, restoring me the joy of thy salvation. That David was God's man. David was called the king. That God chose him specifically. But David sinned. And he got outside the will of God. And it was some of that immorality, that debauchery. And, and they, uh, uh, with uh, thank you. And, and Bathsheba. And so David had to say, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. We are called to holiness. We are called to righteousness. We need the joy of our salvation before we're lost in time and world. And so he says, Put off the works of darkness, the things that bring us shame and judgment. But then he says the positive side. And he says, Notice this. Highlight it. Armor of light. Put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly. Another place the Lord says circumspectly. Walk right. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put Him on. You know, I, I don't go to work like this. Not that there's anything good up here. But I don't dress like this to go to work. A few times, I, uh, it's, it's happened, numbers of times over the year at work that uh, there'll be a death and, and I've got a funeral to go to and uh, I'll have to change clothes at work and so I'll get a timely uh, point right before I need to go to do that. And a lot of times I may have to walk back in the lab and uh, uh, check on something before I go out the door and you can imagine the comments. Oh, is this the new lab uniform and all these different things? And I said, yeah, don't you like we should wear this every day? But no, I usually don't put this on till Sunday morning. But that's a problem. Not that I have to wear this. Nowhere in that Bible says I have to wear a coat and a tie. I just choose to do so. But he says put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put Him on. Put on the armor of life. Put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6. That we be able to withstand the fiery darts of the devil in this evil day. That's He said, put it on. And He didn't say take it back on. But a lot of times our lives as Christians, and we all, we all have more than likely, you got your card into your closet, or everything's mixed together, but I'm going to say it this way. You've got your Sunday clothes, and you got your everyday clothes. 
And so on Sunday, we dress for Sunday. And then the rest of the week, we dress for the rest of the week. Well, physically, whatever you put on, does it? it does, as long as it's modest apparel. That's Bible. Okay? So, as long as we dress, whatever you put on, be sure you put on the armor of God. Put it, be sure you put on the armor of life. Be sure that we walk in the Lord. Be sure that exactly that walk, let us walk honestly and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we put on this armor of chapter 6 to, to withstand the fiery darts of the devil. Uh, and uh, But it, you know, it comes to mind as the Lord says put on the armor of light. It's not only to withstand the fiery darts of the devil, but we're to have the armor on, armor of light for a lost and dying world. That's in a world of darkness. That we are to walk honestly. We're to walk in faith. We're to walk in the righteousness of God. Every day walking in Him. And that means we're to live in Him. Not in the darkness. That's why Paul said to awake. Uh, that to cast off the works of darkness. And that's a very beautiful picture. Cast Get the, the works of darkness gone and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. God's Word says we are to walk in the newness of life. Romans 6 and 4. When we're saved, we're to walk in the newness of life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, right? Right? Old things pass away. All things become new. Cast off the work of darkness. Be clothed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.27 For as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You put Him on. And you wear Him. And we live in darkness being the light of the world. That's what we're to be. The light of Jesus Christ. The lost and dying world. Make no provision for the flesh. To sum up, Paul says time's running short. He said, he says it's shorter than we realize. I, I don't think there's anybody here that will tell me they think it's going to be ten years till Jesus comes. I, I don't think it, especially if you go to the Bible and say he's coming in 2030. If you say that, get on out of here. We don't want to hear that. Or get right with God. That's what I say. Get right with the Lord. We don't know when He's coming. But I would venture to say that there's not a soul in here with the way this world is going. With the way the world. I'd say our country, but it's not just our country. The way this world is going that you would say, Jesus Christ, no way He'll come today, but maybe tomorrow. He can come right now. Amen? Amen? Well, if that time is so short, what do you think we ought to do? Live for Him. Live in His righteousness. Because we're going to be standing, church, we're going to be standing before the, the Lord at the Burma seat before long, the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be there. And as we've studied in, in the Word of God and first Thess on Wednesday night, we did first Thessalonians and, and, and we see the rapture of the church and one of the problems at Thessalonica was that they they thought they had entered into the tribulation. And Paul was very plain writing to him, said, No, not yet. Church is going to be out of here. But then, then tribulation will come. We're, reading, we're studying Daniel, and Daniel doesn't get to see the church, but he does point them through those 70 weeks and what, what's going to happen all pertaining to Israel in that uh, 70th week, but not only Israel, but all those that are left behind. This time is running to an end. Paul says, time is short. And if time is short, we better wake up. We better wake up. But on the armor of light, walk in His truth, and live for Jesus. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That sinners might see the light and come to Christ.
is where they see him and us. Let's pray. So come with a song of invitation. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning for this precious hour and this precious time that you give us. Lord, that we would be moved to live for you more fully. Lord, that we would understand the urgent matter that lies before us to put on the armor of light, to walk in your truth and to put on Jesus, to be clothed in Him. Not of anything that we can do, but all because of Jesus, or that others might see Him, or that we might be pleasing to You, Lord, in all things. Lord, we love You this morning. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for the great love that you have shown us. Lord, that in that love, we would show that same love to our neighbors. Lord, God, us and direct us, forgive us of our sin. Lord, it's in thy name we pray. Amen and amen.